What is implantation bleeding? How do you know if that's what you're experiencing and what else could it be? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And today I'm talking all about implantation bleeding. This channel exists so that you can learn more about your fertility, so I would love it if you would subscribe and share so that we can learn more about our bodies and advocate for our health. Implantation bleeding is really near and dear to my heart. And that's because when I was trying to get pregnant, I had four miscarriages, including one ectopic pregnancy. And any time I saw blood when I had a pregnancy test, I started to get really bad PTSD and get worried. And even in my kids that exist now with one of them, when I had bleeding, I was certain it was going to be a loss because in my brain, despite everything that Madison said, and despite all of these studies, I was sure that meant the end of it, that, oh, it can't just be implantation bleeding because I optimistically thought it was that in my first or second loss, and it never was. But lo and behold, it can truly just be implantation bleeding. And so it's really important to me that we talk about this so we understand what it is and what it isn't, and we know when we should get more of an evaluation or get care to see if something is wrong. In general, implantation bleeding is bleeding that occurs when an embryo is starting to implant into the uterus. We have to know the timeline here because weeks and days, and it all starts to become a big jumbled mess. But remember when you ovulate, that egg is released and then enters the fallopian tube. The egg has to be fertilized within 24 hours inside that fallopian tube. And then that early embryo is going to grow and develop over the course of the next five to six days until it lands into that uterine cavity. So remember, you tend to ovulate around day 14. So for most people, if you have regular predictable cycles, the first two weeks are the follicular phase. That's when you're growing a follicle. Then you're going to ovulate, and that follicle is going to rupture, allow the egg out, and then it's going to heal back up and form a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is then stimulated to make progesterone, and this is now the luteal phase. So in the luteal phase, the corpus luteum makes progesterone, and what is happening is we're getting ready for implantation. And the luteal phase, if you're going to not be pregnant and get another cycle, lasts about two weeks as well. And if your periods are of different lengths, interesting fun fact that the luteal phase is the one that should be set at 14 days. So if your periods are 34 days apart, the luteal phase is 14 days. So you actually ovulate around day 20. You have a longer follicular phase. If your cycles are 24 days apart, you actually ovulate on cycle day 10. Your luteal phase is 14 days and you have a shorter follicular phase. But any bleeding that occurs before an embryo is even inside your uterus has nothing to do with implantation because implantation hasn't started. So that's more of a sign of irregularity in your cycle of an unstable endometrium. Maybe you have a polyp or scar tissue or a fibroid or some other cause that could be contributing to that bleeding. Now you might be getting what we call post-coital spotting or bleeding, and that means post-intercourse. That can sometimes just happen from the blood vessels that go to the cervix, but it is one of the signs that you could have abnormal cells in your cervix or cervical cancer. So if you consistently are having post-coital bleeding, please make sure your pap smears are up to date and get a pelvic exam so somebody can look at your cervix. But that embryo is entering into that uterine cavity, honestly, about days five to seven after you ovulate. So that means it's going to be around cycle days 19 to 21. So that will be the very first time you can see some implantation bleeding, about a week after ovulation when that embryo is coming in. The embryo has to come into the cavity and then it has to find a nice spot in the uterine wall where it can decide to implant. And what actually happens is this is one of the most fascinating processes that exists, is the embryo sends out enzymes, little proteases, and it eats away at the endometrium, attaches on, and starts to eat away at part of the vasculature of the maternal blood supply. There's all these arteries called spiral arteries in that endometrium. So you have these arteries from the maternal blood supply, and you have this little invading embryo that they suddenly start to latch together. And the way that I describe this to my patients is that it's not unheard of that your sending out enzymes to eat something away so that you can implant 
And that might cause bleeding to escape and be seen out your vagina before this full connection is made. Implantation bleeding is classically going to occur in that fourth week of what should be your cycle. So between that day seven to 14 after ovulation, or realistically closer to days like 20 to 28 of that cycle. Implantation bleeding is typically not like your period. It's estimated that about 10 to 20% of pregnant people will have implantation bleeding. It should be light, can be like a light period, light spotting, can be pink, can be dark. It's typically not associated with period pain, but it can be associated with some cramping because implantation is actually a painful process. I was shocked by that. And when I had pain with implantation, I was certain I was miscarrying. But it makes sense that having something invade into the wall of your uterus is not a pain-free process. But implantation bleeding should be short-lived. So most people do not have bleeding like a period, do not have bleeding for more than a few days. And if you do, or you have severe pain, that can be a sign that something's up. When I had my ectopic pregnancy, I actually had implantation bleeding is what I presumed it was, but it kept coming and going. It lasted much longer than three days and it became very dark. And that was a sign, especially once it was paired with pain and one-sided pain, I knew something was not normal and this was no longer good. So Truly implantation bleeding, maybe you have a mild cramp, but should not be a painful process and it shouldn't keep persisting. Overall, there's more things besides implantation bleeding that can cause first trimester bleeding. We know that up to about 25% of pregnancies have first trimester bleeding. It is so freaky when it happens, but it's important to note that that does not put you at a higher rate of miscarriage. In a study that looked at first trimester bleeding, Only 8% was heavy, so the vast majority is implantation bleeding. Most of that was not painful at all. And heavy bleeding was more associated with pain. So things that were not quite as normal. You had higher risk of having heavy bleeding if you'd had history of recurrent miscarriages or you had fibroids, because we know fibroids can cause things to be weird. But what was very important is that the rate of miscarriage between the two groups was not different. So 12% of women in the group who had bleeding and 13% of women in the group without bleeding all experienced miscarriage. And even though this is an older study, these women were age 18 to 45. So this is ultimately a rather low incidence of miscarriage and should make you feel more reassuring that just because you see blood doesn't mean that that pregnancy is not going to work out. However, if you're having other symptoms, so severe pain, heavy bleeding, bleeding that's not going away, if you have dizziness, lightheadedness, if you pass out, those are all also troubling signs and a sign that you should get an evaluation. Other things that can contribute to first trimester bleeding, in addition to pregnancies in abnormal locations or abnormal placentas of pregnancies, can also be things like having what's called a placenta previa. So this is where the placenta is actually covering part of the cervix. And if you have intercourse and all that increased vascularity, you might see some bleeding from that cervix. A subchorionic hematoma or subchorionic hemorrhage is an SCH and may be seen on ultrasound. Especially in the fertility world, about a third of our patients might have this. That's because we see patients so much more frequently. Again, most of the time this is going to go away and not be problematic at all. I hope this helped answer some of your questions and I love having you here. So thank you so much. Please subscribe and share. And as always, you can get more information on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or the As a Woman podcast. Thank you.